The Standard Deviations podcast is a weekly production that looks at money, mind, and meaning, all through a psychological lens. Each week, psychologist and New York Times bestselling author Dr. Daniel Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest, experts in everything from finance to literature to wellness. Support for Standard Deviations comes from the Guardian Network. You know the old saying, a penny saved is a penny earned? How many pennies would you earn if you skipped your next venti iced mocha half-calf latte or that burger that needed five napkins? Over a lifetime, they add up. Like putting a kid through college add up. Find out where your priorities lie by playing the cash stash dash at livingconfidently.com slash play. Hello and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby. Uh, I am joined today by someone who I consider uh, the best living investment writer, someone who does my job better than I do my job. I'm joined, of course, by Morgan Housel. We're going to talk about the psychology of money. So Morgan is a partner at the Collaborative Fund, formerly of The Motley Fool and The Wall Street Journal. He's won all kinds of awards, two-time winner of the Best in Business Award, uh, winner of the New York Times Sydney Award, two-time finalist for the Gerald Loeb Award for Distinguished Business and Financial Journalism, and the Columbia Journalism Review for the Best Business Writing 2012 Anthology. Morgan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Daniel. And you'll normally when I do something like this, I am the quote-unquote behavioral finance expert. But now that I'm doing this with you, uh, I think that that you know there's obviously a clear leader in that distinction. So I need to choose my words carefully on this podcast, which is a no, good thing. I have, I have invited you on uh, under the pretext of having a friendly conversation, but I've actually invited you on for an intellectual joust and to yell at you for taking my speaking and writing gigs. So that's what this is, <laughs> that's what this is really all about. It's just a big ambush. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So Morgan, one of the things, uh, one of the things that I and I think many many of us who enjoy your work marvel at, uh, with respect to your writing, is 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 your consistency in your range. My uh, my favorite writers are able to tie together. Uh, seemingly disparate pieces of information, draw from different contexts and different disciplines, and, and make it all sort of sing. So where do you source your ideas from, and how do you kind of keep from, from getting stale? Well, I think there's several ways to answer that. Um, for the first thing I would say is when people read the, the, the finished product, they're not obviously seeing what went, what went on behind the scenes. So they're not seeing, you know, Tuesday after Tuesday afternoon when I'm running around my office uh, panicked and my wife says, what's going on? And I said, and I say, I'm, I'm worried because I can't think of anything to write this week, um, and which just happens virtually every week. I've been doing this full time for 13 years now. And every single week I wake up and say, oh, my gosh, what am I going to write this week? Like it, it hasn't gotten any easier. And I think if anything, it's gotten harder because the low hanging fruit uh, of article ideas that are obvious to me. I, I've not only picked, but I've literally picked 50 different times and tried to reword the same topic, um, you know, and, and, and just try to come up with a different way to say the same thing. Uh, I mean, one, there, there's, but there's, there's other answers to that as well in terms of, you know, this is all I do. And I'm definitely, I consider myself, and I think other people consider me a blogger. I'm not a journalist in any way. I think those are two very distinct things. And most bloggers are distinctly part-time. Um, they have a day job where they're an investor, they run an asset management firm, whatnot, and they do a little bit of blogging on nights and weekends. Whereas for me, this is effectively all I do. It's not effectively all I do. This is all I do. So I have Monday through Friday, I have all the time in the world to think of these ideas. And given that luxury, I think a ton of people in this field would be able to come up with the same ideas that I do. Um, and then the, the third is just I spend most of my time reading about various topics and most of what my work is and I, I would say quote unquote work is just kind of sitting around reading and trying to think of new ideas and if you were to witness that it would not look like work you would say morgan you don't actually have a job you just sit on the couch and read books all day um, and my wife reminds me of that a lot but that's actually that's actually the legwork for this job is reading stuff and trying to connect the dots between you know how do people think about risk and how do people think about opportunity and weaving that back in to how people make investing decisions. That's all I try to do 
all day. Um, but again, it hasn't gotten any easier over 13 years. It's still a struggle every week. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate you letting us into your process a bit. It's funny when I, you know, I worked for a, for a firm after I got my PhD, I worked for a consulting firm and, you know, wore a suit and, you know, commuted downtown every day for, for a couple of years. And then I, I jumped out on my own, uh, two years after that and started working from home. And my wife, I think was shocked when she saw me, you know, quote unquote working. She's like, what are you doing? You know, you just go, you know, go, go do something. And I'm like, this is, you know, this is the job. Like, this is me, this is me ideating, right? This is me having big ideas. And it does, it doesn't always look like work, but, uh, but it is. So, you know, Stephen Johnson has, has written this great stuff about where good ideas come from. And he talks about the, the coffee shops of the enlightenment. And he talks about one of the reasons so many great ideas happen during the enlightenment is because of the rise of the coffee shop, uh, because people would, you know, for once sit around and drink something that wasn't dulling their senses and, and talk and have these ideas, these, these disparate worldviews come in contact with each other. What do you consider sort of the, the enlightenment coffee shops of today? Where do you look to source new ideas? Yeah, good question. I think it's a, you know, my, my first reaction was going to be, oh, it's Twitter. Twitter is the 21st century coffee shop. Uh, and it's a coffee shop like on steroids to the, you know, by, and it's expanded by orders of magnitude because there's so much information. And it's a coffee shop that is as large as the entire world. So I, I think that is a big source of my learning. And certainly that's, you know, I've learned more from Twitter than I have uh, from my expensive college degree a hundredfold. Like, I, I don't think that's any exaggeration. But I think it's also more than just reading Twitter. It's actually getting to know people, you know, from Twitter on a more personal level. So you have, you know, let's say I follow 380 people, but there are probably 10 people, 10 of those 380 that I've gotten to know very well on a personal level over the last few years. And we talk on the phone and we can text and we DM each other and we send each other emails, uh, just going like a layer deeper that you can't get into on Twitter. And I think that's where a lot of these ideas come from. And I'll give you a real example that just happened like three days ago. Uh, Craig Shapiro, who uh, is the managing director of the Collaborative Fund where I work, called me up and he said, hey, I, I have this idea about market volatility. And I won't go too much in the details, but he said, like, what if because everyone is dollar cost averaging into 401ks and there is just this constant bid that market volatility is not going to be what it was in the past. Like, is that a real concept? And we started talking about that idea um, and we went back and forth and we couldn't really figure out if it was, if it was true or not. But within that conversation, Craig said, yeah, you know, there's, you know, everyone says there's death and taxes. Those are life guarantees. And maybe there's like some other things that are guaranteed. Like is market volatility one of those things? And I said, Craig, that, I, that quote that you just said, death, taxes, and a few other things would be a great article. <laughs> and, I, and I just took that idea and wrote and published that article yesterday. I think that kind of concept is where a lot of these ideas come from. It's just informal chat with people who you know and you trust that you can have intellectual debates with that, um, that, that spark these ideas. It's either that or it's reading a book, reading a, a, a white paper, or, uh, or just finding something on, on Twitter. So that's, that's where the ideas come from. But I think what's important, and maybe this is the most pertinent answer to your question, is that if you try to force that process, if you try to sit down at your desk and say, okay, I need to come up with an idea in the next 30 minutes, I think you're, you're either not going to or your idea is not going to be very good. It's when you just kind of have this like unstructured, wild wandering of just trying to waking up and saying like, I want to read this book about biology or evolution. Like that seems neat. Uh, and wherever it leads me, I'll, I'll figure it out. I think that's where the best ideas come from. But those are also, it's also the most uh, scary kind of work because it's so unstructured and the rewards are so unclear that it makes you feel like you're not working. But, you know, Kier- Kierkegaard, my favorite philosopher, he always talked about happiness ensuing from, you know, living the right way, uh, but that if you tried to pursue happiness, that it would prove elusive. And I've found the same thing to be true of good ideas and, and good writing prompts, that if I'm filling my head with good ideas, if I'm surrounding myself with smart people, like good stuff ensues and I'm, I'm able to make connections. But if I try and force the process, uh, it, you know, it gets ham handed, it gets, it gets, you get stressed out, things don't go well. So 
Uh, yeah, right. I think if you're if you're always doing the right things, you're gonna you're gonna have those good ideas. So I was gonna okay. you know, make a make a joke about Twitter being the gutter, you know, to the to the side of the coffee shop. But <laughs> I, you know, I, for, for all its flaws, I've I've interacted you know with people like you on Twitter. I've interacted with billionaires and Nobel Prize winners and honest to God geniuses. And the the access you get on Twitter is pretty unprecedented. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and so, so maybe Twitter is not the coffee shop. Maybe it's, it's the local bar. Yeah. So it's still people sitting around talking, but it gets messy and rowdy sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was, I was going to say one other thing about like the, the takeaway from that process of just letting your, yourself wander unstructured is I could easily write one or two articles per day. And in fact, I did that for many years. But when you write at that volume, that's when you really do have to force yourself to wake up and say, okay, I need to think of an idea in the next 30 minutes. You have to do that every day. And so that's what I used to do. And if you go back to my days at The Molly Fool, where I was writing two articles a day, when I look back at it, I, 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 was, I was writing, let's say, 15 articles a week, and I was, I was happy with one of them because there was one idea per week that I was just kind of letting my, when I let my mind wander, I would stumble across this one good idea. And then the other 14 ideas were forced. So a few years ago, I said, screw it. Like, why am I going to write 15 articles if I only like one of them? Why don't I just write one article per week? So that's what I've done for the last, uh, last three years. I've gone from writing 15 articles a week to one. And, and, most, and, I, I, and there's still many weeks where I'm not, I'm not happy with that article. I would say maybe there's one article per month that I'm really happy with, but it's a much higher batting average than it was when I was trying to force myself into ideas. Yeah, absolutely. So your your favorite article that your favorite article I've ever read was one, you know, not surprisingly called The Psychology of Money. And you start off that piece with the stories of of two individuals, one named Grace and one named Richard. So Grace is a secretary who, you know, never uh, she was orphaned at the age of 12. She never made much money and yet she died and left millions and millions to charity. Uh, he was an Ivy League educated financier with a 60 something thousand dollar a month mortgage who declares uh, bankruptcy in the throes of the Great Recession. So the point you make here is one that I have uh, made before and one that I marvel at, frankly, is that there is no other field where this is even possible. You know, people, uh, secretaries are not, you know, inventing rocket ships. They're not stumbling onto great engineering ideas. And yet a legion of everyday investors have outperformed the brightest minds on Wall Street, uh, and, and many do year, year after year. So can you speak to some of the mechanics of why this is the case? And then as a follow-on, why does a smart guy like you devote yourself to studying something where skill and knowledge hold so little sway? Yeah, yeah, great question. I bet, to, to the first part of why that is, why is it that uh, an orphaned elderly country bumpkin can outperform this Ivy League educated financier. I think the, well, there, there are many reasons why that is. One of which you could just say is luck. But, but I think, but to your point that you said, no one builds a rocket ship off of luck. No one, you know, constructs a skyscraper off of luck. Um, you know, there's, you know, but, 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 but people do get lucky in finance. But I think it's, it's definitely much more than luck because, so much of what matters in investing over the long term is not what you know, it's how you behave. And behavior can't be taught. Behavior is inbred. And I think someone like Grace was born with a personality and born with a, dis and a disposition that favored uh, patience and long-term thinking. And not all of it is born and inbred. I think a lot of it is learned. I think if you put yourself uh, in the shoes of someone who is living a very humble, simple life in the middle of Iowa uh, in, in a one-room house, that person does not have a lot of social pressure to beat the S&P 500 this month or this quarter. Whereas if you are a hedge fund manager in Manhattan, that is not only a pressure, that's your entire life. And so the, just those differences in environment has a big impact on your behavior over time. Uh, so you, you you put that against kind of the inbred nature of, you know, I, I've always said, and I'm, I'm completely making these numbers up, but I feel like they are directionally right, which is that 10% of people do not need help with investing. They were born with a disposition that lets them just intuitively understand compounding and long-term thinking and patience. They just get it. They will, they will always be good. Even if they have no experience, no education in finance, they'll be fine. 
There's another 10% of people who no matter what you tell them, no matter what you teach them, uh, will always have trouble with finance. They were, they were born compulsive gamblers. They put themselves in a, a social environment that's just going to push them towards bad decisions. And no matter what you tell them, they're always going to be in a bad situation. There's another like 80% of the population that I think want, wants and needs good financial advice. But kind of inherent in that uh, 10, 10, 80 structure is that there are some people who are, who are born with the personality that is suited towards good investing and some who are born with the personality that is not. And so there is that, that kind of, um, you know, that in itself is a form of luck. And finance is one of the few fields where there is not, I, I'm, I'm so confident that there's not a good correlation between effort and output. And that's not true in almost any other field. You know, there's stories about, you know, how did Tiger Woods get so good at golfing? Even when he was eight years old, he used to go to the range and hit a thousand balls. Or there's, I, I remember one of my favorite uh, stories, there's a, a basketball player, I'm sure most people will, will remember him, Mike Bibby. Um, he, probably, he probably retired, I don't know, 2007, something like that. He doesn't play anymore. But there are stories about when he was eight years old, he used to go to the court for 12 hours just dribbling. He wouldn't even shoot. He would just dribble for 12 hours. Like that kind of just massive amount of effort is what creates outlier success. And, but I think in finance, that's not the case. And there is not much evidence that if you devote 12 hours a day to investing, you're going to get any better at it. In fact, there's evidence that you will probably get worse at it on average. There are some people in some funds that, of course, would do well. But on average, if you are devoting your life to trying to beat the market, I, I don't think there's any correlation between effort and results. And you see this with a lot of, uh, a lot of the most successful investors. You take someone like Berkshire Hathaway, and Buffett and Charlie Munger have mentioned that if you take uh, Berkshire Hathaway's top five investments of all time, if you remove those from the equation, Berkshire's results are average. Like all like tails drive those returns and most of your success is going to come from one or two investments. And those investments might not have taken you that much effort. You might not have put that much effort or thought into it. So even the investors that have done really well, I don't think there's any effort, there, there's any evidence uh, about the correlation between effort uh, and, and, and results. And that's why someone like Grace can outperform someone like Richard. Um, and I've, I've forgotten the second part of your question because I rambled for so long on that first part. <laughs> oh, no. It's uh, why, does, why does a smart guy like you, uh, why, why aren't you building skyscrapers or rocket ships? Why devote yourself and your big brain to, to something where, where skill has hold, holds so little uh, impact? I think it's, it's – I mean, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to me. And the, just the whole – puzzle of behavioral finance has always been fascinating to me. And I think it's because it's a puzzle that can't be solved. No one is ever going to be able to say like, okay, I figured out the tricks to behavioral finance, follow these rules and you'll be fine. That's never going to happen. And that makes it just interesting to me in that it's, it's something that you can always keep studying and we're never going to figure out the answer. But I think there's also, and maybe this sounds contradictory to that, I think there is definitely a component of behavioral finance that, again, is inbred, that you are born with certain personality traits. But there's also a big component that can be learned. And even if it's, you can't learn it and fix it, just being aware of your own faults uh, and, and, and trying to put yourself in situations that acknowledges and works around those faults can really help people. And I think we've seen that in the last, um, you know, last 10 or 15 years when behavioral finance became much more important uh, and popular than it was in, in previous decades. And I think a lot of the rise in, uh, of Vanguard and in passive investing is to some extent people coming around to the idea of behavioral investing, that a passive hands-off approach makes sense versus the really active approach where people say, I'm going to dump all of my high IQ into this field and try to get better results. You know, it, you know jumping from that idea of I'm really smart and I can do better to maybe I'm not that smart. And if I just leave it alone, it'll do better over time. I think that's a behavioral issue. And I think getting people to understand that and learning about the mechanics of that is a really important endeavor. So I, I to answer your question, I do it because I think it's interesting. And I think it's also important, not just for myself, but for other people. 
Well, it's interesting. I've said the same thing before. What what many would consider a bug, I actually consider a feature in that you you never quite get good at this. You know, I think uh, for a lot of people, they want mastery over their job. They want to go to the office every day and feel like I've got this nailed. They want to be Pistol Pete or Mike Bibby or whoever out, you know, taking shots in the driveway until they until they have mastery of it. Uh, part of what gets me out of bed every morning is that you, you're never very good at this. And I mean, I was... Uh, I was less confident about my mastery of of human nature and human behavior the day I graduated my PA, with my PhD than the day I started, and I think right. that's you know that's that's very telling uh, that that you know the more you learn about human nature the less you feel like you know and you know Daniel Kahneman the the Nobel Prize winning brilliant you know writer and thinker on behavioral economics has said you know I, eh, I don't I don't know a lot about this you know and if he doesn't right. know much what what do we know right. Well, it's the classic, like, there is no, like, for most, and this was particularly true in men, I think, like, most confidence in investing peaks probably your year or two after college. That's like, when you're 23, 24, that's when you're like, I got this, hold my beer, watch what I can do. Yeah. And as you, and like, and the, the, the good investors, as they get more, more experienced and smarter over time, like, their, their confidence and their own knowledge decreases. And that's a great thing. I think this is one of the fields where, subtractive knowledge is really important. And if you wake up one day and say, hey, this thing I thought I knew, I actually don't understand it at all. I, I don't, that, that does not make you dumber. That makes you much smarter. And it's hard to kind of contextualize knowledge in that way that getting rid of an idea is, is pushing you forward. It's hard to think of it that way because most fields are not that way. If you're studying algebra and you wake up one day and you say, I don't understand the, the you know, you know how, how to multiply polynomials, you are you are considering yourself dumber, but it's not that way in finance at all. And I, I always, you know, I, I think part of what really got me interested in this was looking at my parents' investing history. And to summarize my parents, they're, they're very smart, college-educated people, uh, but have no, uh, no education, no background, no experience, and frankly, no interest in investing. But for whatever reason, my parents and most particularly my dad who is who kind of runs the the family finances realized in the late 80s or early 90s that if he dollar cost averaged into vanguard and never touched anything that was a good thing to do and that's all he's that's they've dollar cost average into vanguard into vanguard for more than 30 years and never sold a single share and if you look at their performance he would literally be you know probably in the top 20 if not 10 percent of hedge fund managers given his results Top five, and, yeah. Right, and he doesn't even know it. And like honestly, and again, he's a. My parents are very smart people, so this is not this is not to you know uh, push down on on their intelligence. But if you ask them why they did that, I don't know if they could even give you a good intelligent response, <laughs> or it, or their response would just be incredibly simple. He would say like, I don't know, lower seem lower fees seem better than high fees, so I picked the one with the low fee. Like it would be as simple as it could get. <laughs> <clears throat> and it led to like this incredible result that again, like what we were talking about earlier, there's no other field where that's the case where someone who doesn't even know why they're doing it, like is one of the best people in the entire industry. <laughs> so I think watch, like watching that really inspired me like that both influenced how I invest, but it also just reinforced the behavioral element to investing versus the really intense education and effort elements of it. Absolutely. So you highlight a bias in the psychology of money piece that you call the earned success and deserved failure fallacy, which I've also heard uh, referred to as the just world fallacy. And this is the belief that poor people uh, got to where they are because they didn't work hard enough or they weren't bright enough. And that uh, conversely, rich people got to where they are, were as a result of their hard work and brilliance. Uh, you're challenging that assumption. And I want to read uh, just a, a quote that you wrote to your newborn son that I found very poignant. You wrote, some people are born into families that encourage education. Others are against it. Some are born into flourishing economies, encouraging of entrepreneurship. Others are born into war and destitution. I want you to be successful and I want you to earn it. But realize that not all success is due to hard work and not all poverty is due to laziness. Keep this in mind when judging people, including yourself. So yeah. I, I absolutely love this. I think this is one of the, misunder one of the most misunderstood constructs uh, in our world today. 
So, but, but I feel like it needs some nuance because half, half of the equation I find very generous and empathic. You, you don't want to judge people harshly, you know, for, for falling on, for falling on hard times. I'm with you there. But as a father, I want to raise my children in a way that they, that they want to work hard, that they want to put their best foot forward. Because while there's not a, not a perfect relationship between, you know, hard work and financial success, there's not, there's not no relationship either. So how do you try and walk this line of saying, look, be, be empathetic, but also, you know, work hard and do your best? Yeah. I, I, I honestly don't know if I have a good answer to that because this, question or this topic in general, I think just by definition in nature is not black and white. It's this really gray zone where of course in success, there is some element of luck and some element of skill. And I think we don't, and we'll never be able to know exactly which is which. There's a good example of this recently in the last month where Forbes listed, um, listed Kylie Jenner uh, as mm. the, 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 the youngest self-made billionaire of all time. And there is a big debate, of course, on Twitter, uh, the, the, the drunken bar of, of, of finance of people saying, how dare you call her self-made? Someone from the Kardashian-Jenner family is not self-made. She had all, all of this. Um, you know, she, had, you know, she started life not on third base, but she started two inches from home plate. And there's an element of truth to that, of course. If you're Kim Kardashian's sister, you have all these advantages that no one else has. Like, of course, that's true. But I think you could take that same idea and apply it to virtually every extremely successful person. Bill Gates went to the only high school in America that had a computer. The only high school in the entire country he just happened to stumble across through no uh, drive of his own, through no effort of his own. He just happened to be there. Um, Bill Gross, the famous bond fund manager, his career started when interest rates were 15%. And ended when they were two percent. If you're a bond manager, that's a great thing, and it's totally outside of your control. So, and like I, I would put both of those things with Bill Gates and Bill Gross into the same bucket as as Kylie Jenner, and say, look, uh, you know, all three of those individu- of those individuals, Kylie Jenner, Bill Gates, and Bill Gross, were very smart and very talented, and they deserve to be treated as successful people and viewed as successful people who put in a tremendous amount of effort and that effort had a contribution to their success. But we should not pretend that it was just for their effort. There were these elements that were completely outside of their control um, that had a major impact on that success. I think that's always true. And just as important, it's true for the majority of poor people as well. Not, not all, of course, but it's, it's true that there are some people who are born in countries or eras or different social classes, you know, you can go on down the list that puts them in a, in a different playing field than you or I. So you talked about that letter that I wrote to my newborn son three years ago. I did a podcast around that same time with Shane Parrish. I think my son was like a month old at the time. So we were talking about what I want to impart on him. And I told Shane, look, my son is a white male born in the United States to college educated parents and he will very likely have a great college education himself. Just those points alone, when he is one month old, puts him on a completely different playing field than you know you could go on down the list of people who don't have that advantage. And all of those things are outside of my son's control. They have no impact on his effort. But I don't like. I want to make clear that effort and skill and you know you know the, what you put into it, your hard work, of course, has an impact. But I think we just systematically underestimate the level of, of, of luck versus skill in both ways. And I think if you try to put more emphasis on it or try to be more empathetic uh, to those topics, I think what it does is it makes you a little bit more skeptical of your quote unquote hero. Not skeptical, but just realizing that, look, is Warren Buffett smart and successful? Of course. Was there also a degree of luck that does not apply to the vast majority of other people? Yes. And another way to frame this is that uh, the same traits that I think cause big success or big failure, I think like the, 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 there are similar traits that cause either one of those. Because in order to have big success, a lot of people have to take a big risk, swing for the fences. And that same behavior, taking a big risk, is also what increases the odds of failure. 
And so when we look at someone who is massively successful or someone who failed at what they're doing, I just think we have to be careful in general saying that person was successful because of what they did or that person failed because of what they did, because it's so easy to underestimate the role of positive and negative luck in both of those situations. Yeah, absolutely. Buffett himself has talked about the unearned advantages that that got him to where he is. And it's, I think it's often forgotten that he was a senator's kid. Like, I mean, he was not born powerless. Like he, we, we talk about his humble Nebraska roots. I mean, he was not a no one, you know, his, his family was, was a, a powerful family uh, and he's, he's worked very hard and he's incredibly bright. You know, I, I think about my own career, my father is a financial advisor. And when I, when I struck out on my own, I had no clients. And so my dad is saying to one of his contacts, you know, look, Hey, I think my son could, could do some good work for you. Makes an introduction. I follow up on it. They blow me off again and again and again because I'm, you know, whatever, I'm 29 years old and like, who is this kid? And finally, I wrote them a letter and said, look, I know you're blowing me off. Uh, I want to show you what I can do. I'm going to fly up there on my own dime. I'm going to wow you with my presentation. If you like it, hire me. If you don't, I'll leave you alone forever. And they said, yeah, okay, come on up. We'll give you one hour. Uh, I went up. I presented, they liked it. They hired me for a, a couple of road shows and every single opportunity I've ever had in finance has directly stemmed from that first encounter. So mm-hmm. uh, would, I, would I have ever gotten in the door without my dad? Like I, I would have to say no, right? You know, I, right. I would not have ever made that first contact without, without my father being who he is. But did I earn it? I mean, yeah, like I took a risk and I worked hard. And ever since then, I've, you know, it's, it's all been a result of my being competent and hardworking. So yeah, nothing's, nothing's that black or white. And I think when we think about it as, as all one thing or another, that's when we're on a uh, dangerous ground. Exactly. And I think this topic in general can uh, rub people the wrong way, especially if someone is very successful and they, they don't want to be told Not all of their success was to their own doing. But I don't think that's how you or I are trying to frame this. I think all we're trying to promote is the idea that it's not black and white. It's some shade of gray. But I honestly don't know, and I don't think anyone knows, what the shade of gray is. Is it dark gray or is it light gray? I honestly don't know. But I think that's just, that's the point we're trying to make. Absolutely. So you mentioned something in the piece that I had never considered, something that you call the rich man in the car paradox, uh, that frame the conversation around consumption and especially, I think, conspicuous consumption in a way that I had, had not thought about. Can you tell us about rich man in the car paradox? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I made up that, that, uh, that name because this is just an idea that I, uh, I noticed myself falling for this idea. Um, so to take it back a little bit, all throughout college, I lived in Orange County, in Orange County California, and I was a valet at a high-end hotel where I got to park lots of fancy cars, Ferraris and Lamborghinis and Rolls Royces. And I loved it. Of course, I was you know, 21 years old. I got to drive Lamborghinis. It was amazing. And every time a fancy car would pull through, uh, of course, because I was, especially because I was a 21 year old male, I would think to myself, wow, what if I had that car? People would think I'm cool. Like that's the, you know, that's, a, that's a, what, what people think. Um, but I never once thought, hey, look at the driver inside that car he's cool. Like I never, I never cared about the driver. I always framed it as imagining myself sitting in his seat, but I never looked at him and thought, wow, that guy is cool. I, 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 I want to shower attention on him. Never did I think about that. And I think this is true for a lot of things in life when you're, um, you know, looking at a, a fancy house or imagining a retirement, very often you don't look, you know, if you see a fancy house, you don't think, wow, that like, I want to be that person. What you think is I want to have that house. And it's just very much like that. The the social signaling is very much a selfish endeavor. And if you take that to the next step, then it's like, you know, do do you really want that car? Because like, do, do you actually want to be the guy in that car? If the attention that you think you're getting is actually not coming to you. Because when you do spend all that money on the Ferrari, a lot of the reason why you do that, not all of it, but at least some of the reason why most people do that is because they think they're going to get um, social capital from that. And people are going to look at them and say, wow, I want to be just like you. When in reality, I think very few people actually do that. When you're driving around town in your Ferrari, people are going to look at your car and say, I want that car, but I actually don't care about you driving the car. 
So it's just a different way to frame. And I think that coming to terms with that idea has, has driven a lot of my frugality. And I think I'm much more, this is true for, I think most men where they're, when they were in their teens and young twenties, and, and I think it's, this is definitely true for men, less so for women, but in their teens and twenties, they have a very, very high uh, aspiration for material well-being for its signal. I want a 10,000 square foot house and a Lamborghini and a private jet. And I think as they get older, that kind of, that push for, I think, I think most people kind of diminishes a little bit because you start realizing what I labeled the rich man in the car paradox, which is that as you get, you know, people, people don't care about you as much as you think. And coming to terms with that has driven a, a lot of my uh, lack of desire for social signaling relative to what it used to be. Well, I think it's a powerful heuristic. It's a powerful thing that I know that I will think think on in the future when I'm considering a big purchase. Because, you know, because you're absolutely right. People brand themselves as, as surely as corporations brand themselves. And I look at my own purchasing behavior, and you know, the the car I drive, the house I bought a couple of years back, all of this. I will be very candid. Was was a signal to the world, like, look at me. I'm you know, I'm doing well. Respect me. And yet when we look at other people who drive fancy cars or live in big houses, we just, we think they're jerks, right? Like we just think they're, right. we do, we don't right. look at them and go, wow, that guy made it. We go, what, you know, how, oh, how, how gratuitous or how wasteful or, you know, what, what good could be done with that money? And so, yeah, we're not, we're not sending off the branded signal that, that perhaps we want. And it's a really powerful, I think, simple thing to remember. There's a really like weird paradox that I can't really get my hands around, which is like one of the most attractive traits in both like the opposite sex and the same sex. If you're just looking for your friends is humility. Uh, but one of the most common traits that people are most pushed towards is bragging. And like those are opposites, even though like the, it's just this weird situation where the trait that other people want you to have is the opposite of what you are incentivized to do or, 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 or feel that you want to do. And I think like, if you can bridge that gap a little bit, that will, you know, that, that pays huge dividends in terms of having a good social life. I had a, a spy on the, uh, a spy on the podcast a few, a few weeks back. And he said the first thing they had to teach men uh, in spy school effectively, because that's what he did was he trained spies is he said, the first thing we have to teach them is ego suspension because it's very natural, especially when, when two men are talking to sort of humble brag your way through a conversation and yet real connection, like real opening up, which is of course in a devious way, what a spy wants you to do, um, is, is achieved by, by humility. And so, right. yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So perhaps the highlight of the whole piece for me, a piece that was full of great ideas, the best one to me, uh, the most innovative to me was this anchor to your own history bias, which says effectively that your personal, uh, your personal experience accounts for a tiny fraction, an infinitesimally small fraction of all the things that have ever happened in the world, but the majority of how you think about the world. Um, so I want to tackle this a couple of ways. You know, first I want to talk about how this impacts our approach to markets. You know, you talked about Bill Gross. I think about my dad, who's a big bond enthusiast and has had effectively a, a 39 year career that has been a solid 39 year bull market in bonds. Uh, but then I also want to talk about uh, how do we approach the world, understanding that our view is so very narrow and how do we expand our view out from there? Yeah, it's, 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 it's very difficult. You know, I was, I was in India recently and they asked me what bias am I most susceptible to, which is a great, great question, question to ask someone who just gave a presentation <laughs> on biases, like, like to, to pretend that this doesn't impact you is of course crazy. So my answer to that was, look, I just gave a pre a 45 minute presentation that was kind of centered around market history and every single chart, every single example that I gave was from the United States. Why? Why did I use the S&P 500 instead of the German DAX or the Nikkei or the FTSE? The only reason why is because I happened to be born in the United States. And in the year that I was born, fewer than 5% of babies in the world were born in the United States. So very small odds that I ended up where I am, but I took those tiny odds and used it as the entire base or like the entire universe of what I consider to be investing history. And that's crazy. So uh, like that bias is, of course, just known as home bias, where people's 
uh, investment decisions and also their view of the world is just anchored to the country that they happen to be born into without looking out the rest of the world. Um, and which is just say, like my investing experience is just anchored to what I've experienced in the United States. And more specifically, what I've experienced, you know, since I've been in, uh, you know, actually saving money and investing, which is, let's say, the last 15 years or even less than that, uh, which is a very different experience than someone who grew up in Germany or Japan, or if you grew up in the United States during the Great Depression or the inflation of the 1970s and 80s, you got a completely different view of the world uh, that is going to that is going to impact is going to have a big influence on how you think about investing and how you think about risk and opportunity. And again, this is one of those things that is completely outside of your control. I had no control about being born in the United States, but that is what completely influenced what my view of quote unquote history is. And all of us fall for that. It's part the country you're born in. It's part the generation you were born into. It's part like the values that were instilled in you by your parents and your teachers. And then so like if you once you realize that that your view of the world is just a tiny tiny sliver of what's happened. Um, and then we're thinking about risk. Like we want to think that risk uh, is indiscriminate and applies to everyone in equal amounts, and it does. But when we actually think about risk in our own lives and how it's going to apply to us, we anchor to the risks that we are familiar with in our own little tiny, tiny sliver of experience in the world. And then so I think a much, a very difficult, but I think that the only like really good way to think about risk is to expand your horizons uh, across to what has happened to other people in other generations and other countries. But that's incredibly difficult to do. And no matter how hard you try, it's not that efficient because going through something and experiencing it firsthand is, is, is always going to be like orders of magnitude more impactful than just reading about it. So I love military history. I love World War II history, but I've never served in the armed forces. So, when, so no matter how many books about the Battle of Stalingrad that I read, I, there's no way that I can come within 100 miles of putting myself in a soldier's shoes. And trying to uh, trying to realize the the sense of fear and uncertainty that they had, I, there's, you just can't do it unless you actually live through it. And that's the same thing with you know on a different scale of living through the Great Depression or living through hyperinflation. You just can't fathom it. So this is one of those things that I think it's very important to try to put yourself in other people's shoes, try to learn from their experiences, uh, rather than just looking at what you've experienced going out of your way and saying, hey, if hyperinflation happened in other countries, of course, it could happen here. I don't think it's going to, but of course it could. And just expanding your horizons to the range of possibilities that you might experience throughout your life as an investor. But at the same time, realizing that no matter how hard you try, you're always going to anchor to your own, uh, your own personal history, which is why when I give a talk about behavioral biases, I am implicitly uh, showing them my own bias by only using charts of the, of the U.S. stock market. So it's one of those things like this is this is a, an imperfect answer, but I don't know what the, the 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 big solution to this is other than trying to expand your horizons, uh, but realizing that even no matter how hard you try, you're only going to get part of the way there. Well, it's it, there's a profound um, there's a profound uh, contradiction in people like you, you and I getting up on a stage and and lecturing you know lots of smart people in the audience around things like home bias or overconfidence or, you know, whatever it may be, because there's a real hubristic sense in, in thinking at whatever 30 something years old, you can get up and, and preach to a bunch of people about things that we're just as prone to. So I think, um, I'm, I'm constantly aware of how overconfident it is for, for little old me to get up on a stage and lecture others about overconfidence. But, you know, I, I think about, uh, I was a missionary in, in Southeast Asia. I lived in the Philippines for, for a couple of years. And uh, when I got back from, from my missionary experience and I, I returned to my home, I had no clothes and I had lost a ton of weight and so nothing fit. And so my, my parents took me out shopping for some, for some nice clothes and I remember, you know, looking at shoes that cost a uh, hundred dollars, and my, my, you know, my parents trying to buy me a hundred dollar pair of shoes. I mean, that was twenty days, twenty days wages for the average Filipino, and I just, I, I could not do it. Like I could not right. do it because my experience had been such, and I had been so impacted by that. Well, uh, sadly, that 
that uh, perspective has long since vanished. And, you, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not, I'm not as, I'm not as humble. I'm not as dialed in because experience, even experience, lived experience is so evanescent. It so easily goes away. And so I really, what you said about, you know, reading about military history, but not understanding it really resonates and so that's where I think a rules-based system becomes so powerful. You, you know, you learn these rules about market tendencies, even if you've never experienced them, you put something in place because our experience is just so profoundly limited. And even right. if we have a powerful experience, the, the half-life of that to stick with us is so limited. So I think that's where you have to become a market historian and just put put strictures in place that will keep you from making dumb, dumb choices. Yeah. And there's also another point here well, about this is, this is one of the reasons why multidisciplinary learning and investing is so important because investing is a study of, you know, risk and opportunity, which applies to a lot of different other fields. So if you are, if you are limiting your study of investing only to investing history, I think you are, you're just, you're looking at this tiny sliver of the world when there's actually so much to learn about how people think about risk and opportunity from politics and military history and, you know, physics and academia, there's all these other fields that have examples of people making decisions with limited information around risk and opportunity, which is what investing is that we can learn from. So just that idea alone is like another form of just um, trying to get outside of your own little sliver, your own little world and trying to see what else is out there. Absolutely. So you've got, this is sort of the last formal question, and we'll get to some fun stuff. I want to turn our attention to two rules that you mentioned in the psychology of money piece that I think can on their face seem a little contradictory. So you're, I think there were 20 um, sort of points you make in, in the piece. The seventh of these was the seduction of pessimism in a world where optimism is the most reasonable stance. The 16th of them was optimism bias and over attachment to favorable odds when the downside is unacceptable in any circumstance. So the behavioral investor is sort of presented with these two weird, uh, this weird fork in the road, because we know on the one hand that the arc of human progress and society and capital markets, it, it bends toward greatness. I mean, the world is getting better. If you, if you don't think that you're not paying attention, are you being sort of intentionally obtuse or selling something, right? So the world is getting better and it, and it, basically always has. So we know that, you know, that's, uh, you know, exhibit A, but we also know exhibit B that every developed market uh, that has ever existed has had catastrophic, like absolutely gut-wrenching catastrophic losses, 75, 80%. The kind of risk that the average investor can just not afford to bear. um, And it, and it comes, you know, without warning. So, so how do we navigate these two simultaneous and seemingly contradictory realities that like, yeah, optimism should be the default, but risk can come in swiftly and it can mess you up to a point that, that your optimism is sort of all for naught. Yeah. I think there's, there's a few different ways uh, to answer it. One is, one is that when you're looking at something like this, that is contradictory. I think what the, the obvious answer to me is, Yeah, it is contradictory because nothing in this topic is black or white. It's somewhere in the middle and you come across these things are contradictory where it's not like physics where E equals MC squared everywhere in the universe. You get these things in behavioral finance where everything is dependent on the context of there's some situations where pessimism is very seductive. And, but then there's also this optimism bias where people default towards thinking everything is going to be great. I think the, the context that is important there is People tend to be pessimistic about the behaviors of other people, but very optimistic about their own behaviors and their own ability to make good decisions. One of the most prevalent examples of this is in politics, where Congress has, you know, like a 15% approval rating, but a 90 something percent reelection rate. How, like, what what is the X, what, how does that happen? And the answer is that. Like in huge, huge degrees, people think that their local congressman is great, but everyone else is as terrible. That's like that's that's not even generalizing that much. If you look at the polls, that's how most people think about Congress. I hate Congress. I can't stand Congress, but I love my congressman. And I think there's that idea also transfers to investing, where people are very confident in general about their own ability to pick stocks, 
or their own ability to make good investing decisions. But they're, on average, very wary of decisions that the Federal Reserve is going to make or that Congress is going to make regarding, you know, the deficit and the national debt and whatnot. Um, or, 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 you know, or what, what uh, I think a good example of this is, is, is high frequency traders, which pro, like for the average investor has no impact on them. But just the idea that there was someone out there who you could not control, who you did not know, you couldn't see their face, but they were doing things to the market that were outside of your control, that scared people and made them pessimistic. So it's just looking at like, what can you control versus what, what can you not control? And I think that's the, that's part of the disconnect between those two things is that when someone comes to you and says, Hey, the Federal Reserve is manipulating the money supply. A lot of people will take that as a pessimistic, uh, they, they, they will, they, they will grab onto the pessimistic side of that argument and say, you're right. I'm really nervous about this. That makes me scared. But then if you say, you know, Hey, how confident are you that you can pick winning stocks? They'll say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm very confident about that. It's just the, the context of what you can, can and cannot control. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I've, I wrote in one of my books that we tend to own the optimistic and delegate the dangerous because I've seen this you know, in all the examples that you mentioned. I saw it recently in a study of American families. You, know, you ask people and the average American thinks the American family is sort of on a, on a roller coaster to hell. But you, know, you ask them about th- their own family and like, oh, we're good. You know, like, we're, we're, gonna, good. We're, like, we're good. We're going to be doing good. You know, where will you be five years from now? Like healthy, happy, prosperous. But what about the American family? Like, oh, you know, we're, we're tanking. And so same thing, same thing with stocks. Um, so yeah, if we, if we can shake this tendency to think that that we're perfect and the rest of the world is is in trouble i think we get a, a clearer view of, of risk and reward and can make better decisions accordingly yeah absolutely and, and it is but there's also like back to this not being black and white i definitely think that one of the the fundamental uh principles of personal finance is having enough flexibility uh in your finances in your budget in the amount of cash that you hold so that you can withstand the actions of other people that might backfire on you, the things that you cannot control. So there's this element too of, you know, we have to just uh, become kind of at ease with the fact that the Federal Reserve might make a decision that sends us into a recession that might happen. And I can't control that. But the way that I'm going to do something about that is by, you know, having flexibility in my budget and my asset allocation that when that does happen, and I know it's going to happen or something similar like that will happen at some point. But when it does happen, I will have the flexibility to endure, to endure it. So rather than just saying either, either I can't control the future or I have full control over my destiny, it's just saying like, look, I, I, like I, I don't have control over the actions, but I'm going to try to do stuff within my budget and my portfolio that helps me endure those actions. Absolutely. So uh, you, the hard part's over. We're going to get to the fun part. As a clinical psychologist, I would not be doing my job if I didn't ask you to free associate on a couple of words. Um, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say a word. I just want you to give me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's do it. Twitter. Uh, fun, useful, and addictive. Greatest thinker ever. Charlie Munger. Peeps candy. Gross. It, correct. The perfect, <laughs> <laughs> the perfect, the perfect day. Uh, nothing on my schedule, a good book and good weather for walking. Love it. Okay. So the last question is we're trying to uh, encourage folks to, to pick up a book and have a perfect day. So what is a book that, that changed your life that you would recommend to everyone listening? Yeah, I, I, I've been asked the question a couple of times on podcasts, and I always gave the same answer, which was a, a trilogy by Frederick Lewis Allen about the history of the United States. But I've said that so often that I want to come up with a different one because I read a book in the last year. Um, well, actually, actually there, there are two books that I want to mention because they both had a big impact on me. Uh, one was the book by Robert Kirsten called Rocket Men, which is the story of, of one of the, the moon missions. I think it was Apollo 11. And Robert Kirsten, I think, is one of the best storytellers of our time. And he was right up there with Michael Lewis and his ability to craft a narrative. And he just told the story about the astronauts from Apollo 11, which was the first lunar mission that uh, they orbited the moon. They came within, you know, a few miles of the lunar surface, but they didn't land on it. But it was the first mission that really just went to there. And what's, what's really amazing about it is because of the incentives of the space race in the 1960s, 
they had literally like six months to put this mission together. And we didn't really have computers or even the calculators back then. And the, the, the fact that they, that we just went from not really knowing anything to orbiting the moon and bringing these, these guys back safely in six months, it was just an absolutely fascinating look at what people are capable of and the risks that some people are willing to take. Like there's just so many elements in that book that was just uh, awe-inspiring and it's so well written um, that it's, it, it's just a great book. And then the, there's another book um, you know, that, that was on the, the history of immigration in New York um, uh, that, over 400 years. Uh, and the, the history of immigrants coming to New York, which of course, for most of American history, New York and Ellis Island and, and, and whatnot has been the portal of U.S. of U.S. immigration. This price shifted in the last 50 or 100 years as it's moved away from Europe towards Latin America and Asia. But for most of American history and so much of the U.S. population, of course, you know, has its roots from European immigrants and the stories that they brought over of, of how um, of, of how. People who are who are who are who are already in America um, were, were, would, would treat them and, and view them and discriminate against them, but also the skills that they brought over. It was just an absolutely fascinating look at how immigration works. And I love the book because it's this conglomeration of economics and history and politics and sociology and language, like all wrapped into one. Immigration is a really fascinating topic. Um, so those are the two books that I think have had the biggest impact on me in, in the last year. Well, cer- certainly timely and topical and a testament to what a multidisciplinary thinker you are. And no, you cannot watch the movie. You have to read the book on the first one, right? It's, no, it's phenomenal. Yeah. No matter how dreamy Ryan Gosling is, you have to read the book. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Morgan, absolutely fantastic conversation with you today. Uh, if people want to read your work, if they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for folks to find you? Best way is, 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 is probably Twitter. My handle is Morgan Housel for, you know, just my first and last name. And, and from there, you know, there's a link to my blog at collaborative fun, um, where, where all my writing is. Uh, that's, that's, that's probably the best way, but I spend most of my life and I'm ashamed of this, uh, on Twitter. <laughs> well, uh, I, I got the new phone that tells you how much time you spend online every week. And it's been a really, really uh, disconcerting look at, at my priorities. So I, I feel you there. Morgan, Thanks thank you for your time today. You've been incredible. Thanks so much. Thanks, Daniel. This has been fun. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, and its affiliates, subsidiaries, employees, and agents. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information participants consider reliable and Dr. Crosby and Guardian are not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken because of the information provided. Guardian trademark and the Guardian G trademark logo are registered service marks and are used with express permission. All materials are subject to United States copyright laws. Copyright 2018 Guardian.